Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We can clap. We can clap. Well, we're going to talk about that in the sermon this morning. We'll, we'll address that. Uh, this morning, we're going to begin by reading today's scripture. We're in a series called Praying the Psalms, and this morning we are looking at Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us bow and worship. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for forty years. I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Lord, as we gather this morning, I thank you. I thank you that we can gather. I thank you for the rain last night that waters creation that reminds us that you care for the good and the evil lord i thank you that um, people gather Um, i thank you for the people of bethany that that their desire to seek you jesus and become more like you and bless in your name jesus we thank you for the scriptures We thank you that they are a lamp unto our feet. And the Holy Spirit, I pray, I ask with a humble heart that you preach through me as I've wrestled with this text this week in an area of my life of a need of sanctification and growing, and I assume in the lives of many of us. Lord, open our ears and our minds, and may our hearts May you, Holy Spirit, make them good soil. In Jesus' name, amen. Catholic priest and theologian um, Ronald Rollheiser, um, one of my favorite authors on kind of spiritual formation, he writes in his book, Sacred Fire, a Vision for a Deeper Human and Christian Maturity. He writes this, Gratitude is the basis of all holiness. The holiest person you know is the most grateful person you know. Let me read that for us again. Gratitude is the basis of all holiness. The holiest person you know is the most grateful person you know. That is a bold claim. And I think he is correct. In my almost 20 years of being in full-time church work and just my experience of being a human, um, but particularly in my role, I've had the joy of sitting with uh, particularly older saints and the ones who are not mature just in years, but in character and quality of life, in Christ-likeness. When I sit with them, the ones who who you sit in their presence and you just feel Jesus' presence, you feel safe, you feel known like you can be yourself, the thing that radiates from them is joy and gratitude and thankfulness as they reflect on their years. The good and the bad, the the beautiful and the hard, they, they are thankful for all of it. They are truly mature. And the opposite is also true. I've sat with people who are mature in years, but they are still infants in the faith. When they look back on their life, 
The good was never good enough. The bad was somebody else's fault. It's grumbling, it's complaining. And in their presence, I don't feel safe. I don't feel the presence of Jesus. I feel condemnation and fear of judgment either to my face or to my back when I leave. Which person do you want to be? Some of you are like, I'm cranky and old and I deserve it. Well, listen up. I know what kind of person I want to be, and honestly, I'm not headed for that trajectory most of the time. Given to my own just natural wiring, this is a joke. Just be careful. Just understand. I am a boomer named Karen. (laughs) It's a meme. I have the divine gift of complaining. And times, it's a superpower. I will get the $3 refund from the grocery store. I will. It might cost me four days, but Karen's coming for you. I have the divine gift of complaining, but often, like, I joked last service, my wife was sitting over there, and she's like, oh my gosh, yes, he does. But I can become jaded. I can become cynical very easily. I I tend to walk into a room and, and see what's wrong and what needs to be fixed. And at times that has its place, but, but left to my own devices, I'm not, ex- for me to, to ooze joy and thankfulness and gratitude is not what I naturally do. I'm not, think- I'm not, I'm not thankful for that, but I'm self-aware about it. So do I just pull the Lutheran card and be like, well, I'm just a poor, miserable sinner, so thank goodness Jesus died for me, so I'm just going to continue being a jerk the rest of my life. We laugh, but many of us, that's kind of what we do. We just grow into that person and think, well, Jesus is okay with it. Rather, actually, there's another way that God desires us to be a people marked by joy and gratitude and thankfulness. This morning, just before we kind of move on, this is not going to be a a self-help life hack Fill out your gratitude journal, and suddenly, voila, you'll just have everything you want. Who's familiar with gratitude journals out there? Yep, some of you. Cool. Um, Like gratitude, thankfulness in our culture is a big thing, mindfulness. And and so I went to Amazon, and I, I typed in gratitude journal. If you know what that is, it's like a journal that you pay someone to send to you to write things you're thankful for. And on Amazon Gratitude Journal, over 10,000 titles pop up, anywhere from $5 to well over $40. Here's like the top five titles I found. This first one is the first title. The Gratitude Journal, five minutes a day for more more happiness, positivity, affirmation, productivity, mindfulness, and self-care, dash, a simple, effective, undated daily guide planner for women and men. Hmm. Wow. The five-minute journal, reflection, manifestation journal for mindfulness. The five-minute gratitude journal, give thanks, practice positivity, find joy. Oh, that's where it is. And gratitude journal, invest a few minutes a day to develop thankfulness, mindfulness, and positivity. They make it seem so simple. If only I had my gratitude journal, you can hear the cynicism oozing from me in the moment. Now, if you have a gratitude journal and this is a practice, good on you. Like the studies show scientifically that like practicing this, writing these things down every day has a positive effect on your mental health, even your physical health. Like keep doing it. But I wonder if there's actually a deeper practice because God desires his people to be a people marked by joy and gratitude and thankfulness in all circumstances to help us mature to become more like Christ. So as I preach this morning, I am preaching to myself because this is not how I am naturally wired. This is very difficult for me, and I assume for many of us, especially given the state of our world right now, And we're going to look at Psalm 95, and Psalm 95 opens, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. 
I was a full-time worship director. That's what I went to school for. Like, I was the guy with the guitar that would use this psalm as like a hype man. Like, make a joyful noise. Come like, I heard someone call it like biker worship. Stick your hands up. Like, oh, I love Jesus, right? And uh, I, I've been joking, like the 745 service uh, here at Bethany is divine service. I love it. It's beautiful. There's like no clapping. There's no nothing, like no emotion at all, right? The nine o'clock is our blended. Like for some people after that song, there's like, And some people like, Pastor, if you clap, it's a slippery slope. It's a slip. Next thing you know, there's going to be lights and mist. Like, watch out, right? And then even after the 9 o'clock, like, or the 11 is our our modern service. And like, for Lutherans, it's like, you may see like the crazy hand waver, but like, compared to like most non-denom, like charismatic churches, we're still very, very, we're very Lutheran. Very Lutheran at worship. I'm kind of joking at that, but kind of, but, but we, 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 uh, we hear things like this, like the psalmist is telling us, make joyful noise. Like, it's all throughout the Psalms. These were calls of worship. It was the psalmist calling God's people to come before the presence of the living God with shouts of joy, make a joyful noise with songs of praise. We're getting there. We're getting there. These are good things. And then the, the, the psalm's kind of broken up in two halves. And, and the psalmist goes on to explain like what that looks like to bow down, to kneel. To, to, and he uses language of Psalm 23 that, that the Lord is our shepherd and we're in his pasture. We're free to worship and praise him. These are good and beautiful things and they should be used for a call to worship. But then in verse 7, it gets really weird, really fast. He makes a hard left turn. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Merabah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your father has put me to the test and put me to the proof. Though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I never used the second half of this psalm for a call to worship. (laughs) Like imagine Kim, like raise your hands or you will not enter my rest. Right? Kim's way too sweet. She would never do that. Pastor Danner, on the other hand, we'll see. <clears throat> it's my last one before he's back. It's my last one. What is the psalmist doing here? This is why this psalm is much more than a hype man call to worship, try and get people to experience some emotional response to music and lights and, and charismatic leaders. It's actually a prophetic warning to the people of Israel saying if you lose the way of gratitude and thankfulness in your hearts, you're going to end up like your ancestors. And he starts with, do not harden your hearts, as in two places that I cannot pronounce the names. I'm going to, Meribah, there we go, and Massah. We need to remember that the Psalms were the prayer book of the nation of Israel. They are written by real people in the context of real situations. And here the psalmist is bringing Israel's attention back to Exodus 17. After Israel had been redeemed through the waters that they had been enslaved for 400 years, and Yahweh defeats the most powerful army at the time and redeems them, sets them free, and they're wandering in the wilderness, We read, therefore the people quarreled with Moses, their leader, and said, give us water to drink. They were thirsty. They were in the wilderness. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why do you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Slavery, 400 years. 
Yahweh had just done miraculous signs and they're quickly forgetting. No longer shouts of praise and gratitude and thankfulness, but quarreling, complaining, grumbling. We look at Israel and go, silly Israel, I would have been doing the exact same thing and so would you. So Moses goes to Yahweh. He's like, Yahweh, you gave me these people. They're your people, and now they want to kill me. What do I do? And Yahweh's like, Moses, take your staff. Go to a rock. Strike the rock. Water will come out. We'll be okay. So Moses is obedient to Yahweh, does it. Water comes out, and everyone drinks. Yay, we're not thirsty anymore. But this is how the story, the author ends, ends the story for us to remember this. He doesn't keep our attention on the miracle that came from the water that came from the stone, but rather from the, the people's hearts. And, and he called the name of that place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And if you follow the story, the history of Israel, their hearts get harder and harder and worse and worse and worse. And the psalmist says to the people that are gathering for worship, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Quite literally, do not repeat the sins of your father because if you do, you will not find my rest. This psalm is a prophetic warning. It's the antidote to the hardening of heart that, that Israel, keep your hearts focused on gratitude and praise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. It was also a warning to the early, early church, the author of Hebrews. He's writing to this new church, that this new group of people, the new Israel birth out of the life, death, and resurrection, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the sent ones. And he quotes Psalm 94, but he, he goes even further saying, if you, if you harden your hearts, you're actually going to fall into unbelief and cut yourself off from the branch of Israel the one true God that has f uh, fulfilled all the prophecies in Christ. Do not harden your hearts. And we have the same warning for us today. I've been off of social media now for like th know, three weeks, four weeks, almost like a little over a month. And my life is so much better. <laughs> it's so good. Haven't been on Facebook, haven't been on Instagram. Like, you should do it. When you go home, just find that delete button and delete it. Oh, it's so good. But the one thing I have kind of kept is, social, or is YouTube. It counts as social media. And uh, during um, lunch, my lunch break, or I have a little time to kill, I'll go watch a video or interview. And, and my algorithm's kind of full of kind of like well-known Christian pastors or authors or podcasters or like Christian thinkers. And, and, um, and these are people who have massive influence, you know, like they're pastoring tens of thousands of people or, or they have a New York best time seller book or they have a podcast that reaches millions of people and they're influencing kind of Christian culture, if you will. As I sit there and watch many of these, and these are men, women, old, young, across the span, many of them, I would sit there and watch, and, and really it's just them complaining. <laughs> complaining about how bad the world is, how awful our culture is. If we just get back to the good old days or get things how they used to be, then finally the church will be in charge again. It's just wah, 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 wah. And I fall into that easily. Are there things that like, are crazy in the world? Yeah, are there things about the culture that the church needs to speak into? Yeah, but the only way that we're gonna grow any, have any kind of uh, uh, like any influence is not by complaining, <laughs> judging, condemning, quarreling. It just leads to a hardening of hearts. What kind of church do we wanna become, Bethany? <laughs> Do not harden your hearts. Again, this has not come naturally for me. God has an amazing sense of humor. Monday, 
is when I start my study, I'm going through commentaries. And guess where I was studying this week? The San Marcos Courthouse for jury duty. So much fun. Love it. Love writing a sermon on gratitude and thankfulness as I'm sitting in the courthouse seeing if my number will be called or not. And on top of that, it was for a case for sexual misconduct against a minor. I'm sitting there going, God, really? Like, this is not fun. I'm not, I'm not gracious right now. I'm not full of gratitude. They made us all exit and they shuffled the jury. And kind of like that time, I text my wife, I'm like, this is going to take forever. And I sit down and the, 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 um, I didn't get selected, by the way. Praise the Lord, I guess. I don't know. And uh, the, um, the first lawyer looks at the side I'm on, I'm on. He's like, hey, by the way, if you're on this side, you're not getting selected, but you still have to sit here for the next four hours. I'm like, oh my goodness. Right? I'm sitting there, and I'm complaining, and I'm grumbling. <clears throat> and as I'm studying, um, I'm led to the Hebrews passage, and Um, And then in Hebrews, the author writes this also, through him, that being Christ, let us continually offer up a what? Sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. What's a sacrifice? It's offering something up that you don't want to give up. For me to complain, for me to call on my inner Karen is not sacrifice. Like that's just called a Monday, right? Right? But to offer up sacrifices of praise of something I don't want to do, my heart's not inclined to, take some effort on my part. So I'm sitting there studying. I know I'm not going anywhere for a while. So I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm going to read Psalm 95 and try to pray it and see what happens. Like, I'm not happy to do it. I'm like, doesn't the judge know I have a sermon to write? I have important pastor stuff to do. It's also a long weekend, so I want to get home. I start praying Psalm 95. And I read, for the Lord is, is a great God and a great king above all gods. I'm like, all right, Lord, you are above all. You're above this, this courtroom. You're above, you're the ultimate one that brings justice. Lord, thank you for the men and women trying to serve and bring justice where it needs to come. I'm trying to think of things I'm thankful for in that moment. And then I read, in his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. Lord, you are king over the universe. You are over it all. You are not surprised by any of this, Lord. Lord, help me be thankful that I can be in a country where where justice is imperfect as we do, that they try to bring it. Lord, help me. And I read, the the sea is his For he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. I'm reminded that in the Old Testament, for the Israelites, the sea was an image of chaos and fear. And and Lord, even the chaos of this, this alleged sexual abuse against a minor, Lord, that you are active in it, Lord. And I'm praying, and I'm praying. And by the way, this sounds way more spiritual than it actually was. Like, like it was not, this was more just like obedience, like, I don't want to do this, Lord. And I'm trying, and I'm praying this. I'm, I'm grumbling my gratitude and thankfulness, and I start to notice my heart begins to soften a little bit. And even as I look at the person being accused of this act, I find myself praying for them even, because that was not my first inclination when I first heard of the charges. And my heart started to soften as I offered up praise and gratitude and thankfulness. And then we're dismissed. And I walk out of the nice air-conditioned courthouse into 105-degree weather and go, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'm in process, and so are you. Gratitude is the basis of all holiness. The holiest person you know is the most grateful person you know. I've heard it said that there are no accidental saints. I think of the people in this congregation over the last two years I've had the honor sitting with, especially the ones in their 70s, 80s, 90s, even in, well into their hundreds, and I sit with them and I'm in the I'm in the presence of a mature follower of Christ. Gratitude, joy, thankfulness. I feel like I'm in the presence of Jesus. They didn't just wake up at 99 and be like that. It was the course 
of 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years of practicing gratitude and joy, offering sacrifices of praise, and the same is on the flip side. Those who are full of grumbling and quarreling and complaining, it took 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years to be formed into that person. Psalm 95 is a prayer. It's words God has given us to pray back to him. It's a prophetic warning. It's an invitation into practices to grow into Christ-likeness. Dallas Willard, who's a Christian writer and philosopher at USC, he has a line, something like, grace is opposed to earning but not effort. Grace is opposed to earning but not effort. Psalm 95 is the exhortation. It's a command. It's, it's offering a sacrifice of praise that we actually have to participate, bring in by, by God's grace, by the Holy Spirit in us, bring our will into line with God's will. And for some of you, you just wake up and you're like, thank you, Lord, it's a beautiful day. Like, you're awful. You're awful. Can I just have a little bit of your sunshine, please? But for some of us, it's a sacrifice of praise. And I pray, however long the Lord wills me to live or for you to live, that, that, he, that, that I practice these things to be formed into that person of maturity, of gratitude, of holiness. So this morning as we get we prepare our hearts to come to the table to receive a tangible gift of grace and forgiveness of sins through Christ's body and blood. My reflection on this psalm this week led me to a lot of confession, a lot of realizing, Jesus, my heart is so hard, there's no way I can soften this on my own. can't. But also, upon that confession, the repentance is, is starting the gratitude practices each day. You can go order one on Amazon for like $9.99, or you can just grab a prayer journal out there, and for $4.99, no, I'm just kidding, it's totally free, <laughs> is our prayer that leads you through the Psalms we're preaching through this summer. And start writing those things down. But right now, as we prepare to come to the table, I'm going to lead us in a time of confession. So join me. Lord, as we um, reflect on these words of the psalmist, do not harden your hearts. Lord, we just take a moment to um, be still before you for a moment and think over the last day or week where we have given in to quarreling and to complaining um, and not bringing praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, and convict us of those moments. Lord, where we have grown bitter and jaded towards you, um, towards our neighbors, towards the world, Lord, um, man, soften our hearts, Jesus. Soften our hearts. We trust that only you, you can give us a heart of flesh. Jesus, take our hearts of stone, and turn them into hearts of flesh, living, healthy. Come, Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, as we come to this table, Christ here is your confession. He knows the broken, hard places of your hearts. 
The psalmist says, if you continue to harden your hearts, you will have, we will not have my rest. But Jesus says, come to me. Rest in me. Take my yoke upon you, which means walk with me. That his way is light. Unload those burdens to him. Because he loves you. He has given himself for you. He, he absol- absorbed your hate and your frustration and your grumbling and quarreling unto himself. And all he pours on you is love and grace and forgiveness. And if you desire to receive that love, grace, and forgiveness, say, I receive it. It's yours, brothers and sisters. God is forming his people into people who are marked by gratitude and thankfulness and joy. So we join in with the saints across time and space as we confess in this life-giving, joy-giving, gratitude-giving God in the words of the creed. Join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.